It seems good to be back in the house of the Lord tonight after such a wonderful night as last night was. And we had a glorious time these last two or three nights here in the building. And we're thanking our Heavenly Father for it. Souls has been born into the kingdom of God. And such good reports from the healing services. And we just got word a while ago that the girl that was from somewhere up above here in some city that had the leukemia when uh, she was pronounced well today by her doctor. That the, the baby is well. Mm-hmm. And um, the, she was to be a missionary. You remember the case. And... Um, and uh, Satan was trying to to rob her of such, and she is pronounced sound and well from by her doctor. And the blind minister that was here to receive his sight, and others, and there's just uh, great things the Lord is doing. Amen. Now, last evening I took a group into the prayer room in here for just to see if the new ministry that has been promised would come into existence in the tabernacle here before we hit the tent. Well, now, as far as I know, there was nothing no more than just uh, just soon as the one in there, the Spirit of the Lord came in, and it just started discerning the spirits and telling the people of their troubles and so forth. But I wonder, I asked those people if there were any possible way for them to stay. I would just like to ask them, if there has been a change in them, if they feel that they have been healed or any visible change in any way, I uh, asked them tonight if I'd call for them, if they could get in the building, I'd like them to hold up their hand. Now, if they're here and didn't have to go home, they were all out of town people. And if they didn't have to go home and has got inside the building and you feel that there has been a great change, would you hold up your hand? The ones that, if any here, that was in the building last night and was prayed for back here. As I don't see any hands, I don't know where the people could even stay. There, one, one back here. All right. Uh, one there. Well, that's very fine. You feel that there has been a change. In, uh, is that right, sir? You had held your hand. Yes, I've been up all day. Well, that's good. We, that's very fine and we're thankful there was nothing visible that we could see you see because and there was a, a lady uh, in the room who uh, was bothered with a mental condition and the Holy Spirit began to speak to her and telling her the things that was take, had taken place in her life where she thought that something had happened to her which had not. And I guess if our brother is one of his presents that knows that. And then it began to tell her of a person that had long beard and a long hair, had prayed for her. She had done, got away from her. She said no. And then to show the accurateness and the perfectness of the Holy Spirit, it went back again and picked up the person and told him who it was and where it was that it happened. Then she said, I remember now, that had been long years ago, how that the perfection of the Holy Spirit, Amen. oh, He's so Amen. real. Amen. Now, we are crowded in just this little meeting here uh, just before leave again. And I was happy tonight to meet just as they come in an old friend, Brother Rogers from down at Milltown, Indiana, and friends that I haven't seen for years. Brother Creech again, he was here last evening, and today in the interviews, the Holy Spirit was wonderful today, and it seemed like it, maybe it's just going to continue on for a while until that tent comes in up under the same ministry that I've had. Amen. Because in the interviews today... There were four great outstanding visions took place in in the interviews. So seemingly maybe I will continue on until maybe the tent starts or wherever it is he has chosen to begin 
to declare his name in a new way. But when it does, it'll be just as perfect as the others. It'll be just... And I'm trusting to God that it will be greater than the others, not because of of our ministry, but because of the sick and needy people. Amen. There's such a need in the land today. Now, we'll get right straight to the Word and uh, so that the old standing won't have to stand too long. Now, first, before we read His Word, let's speak to Him in person as we bow our heads. Dear God, we come into Thy holy presence now with humbled hearts and bowed heads. And we are asking Thee to forgive us of anything that we might have done or, or thought or said through this day that has been contrary to Thy uh, will. We would ask that You would graciously pardon every one of us and we have gathered tonight for no other purpose but to worship Thee and to express our feelings and the adoration of our heart to Thee. And we are sure, Lord, that this uh, little congregation that's jammed into these little walls tonight has not come here to be seen. Amen. They have not come here for no other purpose but to express their love to Amen. Thee. Jesus. They would not stand on the outside around the windows and around the walls and their limbs aching just to be seen. They are here because they believe that You are Amen. and a rewarder of those who will diligently seek after Thee. We would ask pardoning for all the sin of the people and a healing power to be brought up on the sick and the needy. And we'd ask thee to bless thy word, Lord, as we read it. We are insufficient to interpret this word. So may the Holy Spirit come and get right into the word and plant it deep into the hearts of the people. And may through this there be a great harvest of souls and a great healing service. Grant it, Lord, for we humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> for a scripture reading tonight, I wish to read out of the book of Second Kings beginning at the 8th verse. And my text tonight is looking at the unseen. The first night I was preaching on the subject of raising him up out of history. And the second night, last night, I was preaching on the subject it wasn't so from the beginning. And tonight... My text is looking at the unseen. Now, 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, beginning at the 8th verse. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall we be camped. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place. For thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent unto the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elijah, 
the prophet that is in Israel. He telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and passed the city, both the horses and the chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for there be with us more than with they be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open this, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire about Elijah. I may the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. It is a strange thing that man who was made in the image and the likeness of God and was called of him to walk by faith, believing that God is would choose to walk by sight instead of by faith. After his makeup, his being, and all that dwells in him was fashioned in the likeness of God. And God is that great Jehovah who calls those things which were not as though they were. And man made to live with God in this manner, yet has he chosen to walk by his sight. He wants to be his own boss. He wants no one to tell him what to do. That's just the nature of man. It proved to be thus in the Garden of Eden. When he had lost his fellowship with God by choosing to go his own way, not have anyone rule over him. But a man is made like a sheep and a sheep cannot find its way back. I'm told when it's lost, it's totally lost. And that's the way with man. When he is lost, he is absolutely helpless. He must have a shepherd to guide him. And man, when he chooses, as the days go on, we find man continually getting worse, choosing rather to walk by sight than instead of by faith, by the unseen. And when he does that, he robs the inner man, which is the soul. And that's the eternal part of man. Now, man shall not live by bread alone, said the Lord, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And a man's physical being to be taken care of is not all the reason God put him on the earth. Because what he does with this physical being amounts to very little. It's his soul what counts. It's the inward man that did not come from the earth. It come from heaven. And that's the eternal part of the human being. 
But yet, strange that he tries to figure his own way out. And we find it so in the Scriptures that when a man chooses to walk in his own way and do the way he wants to, God just lets him alone. Man must not think for himself, but he must let the mind that was in Christ be in him. We are not to think for ourselves. We are to call anything contrary to what he said as though it is not. No matter what our eyes claim to be, we do not live by what we see. We live by what we believe. Amen. A few days ago, I was listening to a program on the radio coming to Sunday school. And it was a round table discussion with teenagers in Louisville. Uh, what was one of the most important thing? Was the girl to find the boy with the curly hair or the boy, the girl with the pretty blue or brown eyes? Did that make the difference? It seems like that that would be the great thing to a teenager. But that isn't the greatest thing. The greatest thing is find your God, your maker. Don't mix Mary. Marry a boy that believes just exactly like you do. For after all, God is the main important thing that we are in the earth to do is to serve Him. And if you do marry or anything contrary to that, you'll pay for it in the days that lays ahead of you. You must always remember by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by faith. And we look at the unseen. And we might go on for several hours speaking of the modern day of how men and women today just completely look and they go down the street. And they're going to choose a church that they must uh, go to and bring up their children in. And they'll search around through the city, not trying to find the most spiritual church, but the biggest church that they can find. Amen. The one that's got the, the, the greatest crowds and the best dressed and the celebrity of the city goes to this such church. Where it's called the better class, as far as man know. And then in that church, they'll try to find a minister. That's what they call not narrow-minded. That'll just about let them live any way they wish to and belong to that church. But the spiritual man on the inside, if you'll give him the right of way, he might lead you to a little mission somewhere where there is not many people, but there is the Spirit of the living God. For the outside man feeds on psychology and intellectual, but the inside man feeds on the Word of God. And now if we should turn in our Bibles to many of the characters of the Scripture, it would take us hours to go through it. But let's just think on the book of Hebrews 11th chapter for a few minutes. And we read here that Abraham, he was just a man, and he lived in the city of Ur in the land of the Chaldeans. And just an ordinary man of everyday walk, but one day he come in contact with God. And Abraham was changed from that day on. 
No matter how well he attended his church, the church of his father, but when he once met God, he was a changed man. And I believe that that has not ceased to exist yet today. A man may be a loyal church member. He may be walking upright before his neighbor and his family. But when he meets God, he's a changed man. Some time ago, I remember of talking to an intellectual person that said, how will you ever know there is anything different than what just any religion could produce? I said, I read in the Bible of a living God. I read of His goodness. I read of His patience and His power. And I believe that just as much as anybody could believe it. But one day I met that one I read about. Then there was a sudden change. And I've never been the same since. And hope I never will be. Something takes place when sight fails to produce it. Faith is there to catch the place and produce it. And we see that Abraham, he was not a young man when this happened. He was an old man. Seventy-five years old. And his wife Sarah, which was his half-sister, and they had been married many, many years. Since she was a girl of about 17, it's believed. And God told Abraham, I have chosen you and Sarah that you are going to have a child. And Sarah had been barren all her life. But Abraham never looked at what his eyes would see, an old wrinkled woman, many years past the time of life to have children, but he looked at the unseen and he saw Isaac. By faith he saw Isaac. And he, after looking to the unseen, he called those things which were not as though they were. He got a glimpse of the unseen. By faith he saw it. And the Bible says that he endured as seeing the invisible God with him all along the road. When a man once catches that vision of the invisible God and know that He's always present, there's something that stabilizes that man's thinking, it stabilizes his actions, and in the time of distress and trouble, it'll still make him look upward and above the things that are happening around him. Because he's looking at the unseen, yet by promise. Now how Abraham, not only did he see the unseen, and the reason he believed it was because God said it. And if we being dead in Christ, we are Abraham's seed, and if the Spirit that was in Christ dwells in us, It does the same thing. It takes every divine promise of God that's in His Bible and calls it present tense and rests itself upon there. Or if you look at with your eyes and you see now that our nation is shaking and trembling, wars, clouds are flying everywhere, Every nation under distressed and perplexed of time. Every sign that Jesus said would happen is happening. 
there would be signs in the heavens above and in the earth below and great things would be taking place like the flying saucers and mystic things taking place. But he commanded his church to lift up their heads in that day and to look up for the unseen Christ will be appearing pretty soon. So if we only walk by sight, we would be children of darkness, sure enough now. But I'm so glad to know that there is a light that shines in every believer's heart unto that eternal day when Jesus shall come. Now it is a lesson to us to look to what Abraham did. And then not only did he believe it, but he made ready for it. He made preparations for the, this child that he saw by faith 25 years before the child ever come. Because he had considered that he who told him was able to keep the promise that he had told him. He didn't consider any of his nature being a hundred years old, his physical being. Or did he not consider at all the deadness of the womb of his wife Sarah. And the writer of the divine commentary tells us that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, Amen. but was strong giving glory to God. Amen. What a person. And today there is no need. There's no need of even trying to approach it. With an intellectual faith. You'll never be able to do it. Amen. You go from church to church. And from prayer line to Amen. prayer line. And never get it. Amen. You've got to come to the place. Where it is eternally settled once for all. Amen. He either is God or he is not God. Feeling sorry for the people. As I was speaking last evening. And Jesus said, I am the vine. And ye are the branches. And the vine bore the first branch. And the first branch was Pentecost. And the Pentecostal Blessing is recorded in the book of Acts. Amen. And if the first branch was Pentecost, the second branch will have to also be Pentecost. Amen. And it will have to bear the same type of a church and behavior the first branch bared. Amen. Did not Jesus speak of that in St. John 14 when he said that the branch that did not bear fruit would be cut off? It would wither? That's where our denominations today are being, will be pruned off of the vine. Only the fruit bearing, the kind that bears the fruit and the works of the Holy Ghost shall be able to continue in the vine. For the life that is in the vine puts forth in the branch. And the life that was in Jesus is in the first church. And they did not walk by sight. They walked by faith believing what Amen. God said was the truth. Amen. Oh, what a difference it is. When man who will walk by faith... And call anything that's by sight that's contrary to the word as though it was not. Amen. We need that type of faith in the church. Amen. Moses, when he had become 40 years old, a young man, and as far as sight was concerned, Moses had the world in his hand. He was the next Pharaoh of Egypt. And he had all the lands in the world right in his hand to be king over the entire earth knowing of that day. And yet he looked through the window that Pharaoh looked out of. 
and he saw those Hebrews. To Pharaoh who looked upon them, they were nothing but a bunch of mud daubers down there in the mud making brick. To the celebrity as passed by, they were the same, the well-dressed people that was a bunch of slaves, nothing but mud wallowers. But when Moses looked out the same window, he saw them different because he looked at the unseen and know that God promised that he would deliver them out of that place and take them to the land of promise. For he looked at the unseen. He saw the years that were coming ahead. He saw Egypt destroyed. Yet she was in her blossoming time. He saw Egypt as she is today. And he saw Israel all comfortably seated around Abraham in glory. And by faith he chose to take the the worst the religion could do. Give him and compare it with the best that the world could give him. And he chose to suffer the reproach of Christ and considered it a greater treasure than all Egypt could afford to give him. Because he endured as seeing him who is invisible. God had spoke to Moses. And Moses knowed who God was. So he did not look upon the brightness... And here I might say to the church tonight. Moses had in one hand the best the world could give him. There could have been no better. It was the highest office. It was the best the world had. And religion offered him the worst that could be given. A bunch of slaves in a mud pit. And now if a man was looking... Which side would he take? Let me say this with sincerity and without any malice. But let me say this that you'll understand it. Today, don't look at the big church. Don't look at the great denomination. Don't look at the well-dressed. But look at Christ. Who was rich and became poor that through his poverty you might be made rich. And when you're seeking a church, don't go where all the celebrity goes are the big PhDs or DDs. But look down upon the people who are looked down upon. And Moses, when he had them in both hands. The best the world could give to what he could look at. And yet when he looked at the unseen, the worst the church could give him, he chose to walk by faith. And he chose to walk by the unseen. God counting it a greater treasure than all his sight could afford to show him. Here was a kingdom. Here was a kingship. Here was a throne. Here was a crown. Here was everything in his hand. But yet by faith, when he caught a glimpse of Christ out there in the mud pits, he went to his people. Now, here's another little lesson on Moses. Now, Moses didn't just sit back and say, I sympathize with those people. Those are good people. I, you know, I would not speak one word against them. Now, that's the way a lot of religionists does today. When they hear a strict message about the real God, they'll say, oh, I have nothing against those people who believe in divine healing. I have nothing against those people who believe in miracles. But that's not enough. Moses just didn't sympathize with them and stay on the throne. He went out and become one of them. I remember a few years ago, when I had a great offer with the Baptist people and then the Presbyterian people that a lady of this city was paying my way through a short school in the Presbyterian denomination. And they wanted to take me in as a minister. But when I looked out and seen that the group that believed in the supernatural was laughed at and called holy rollers, 
been easy to have continued on a Baptist preacher for I was one. But instead of looking at him and said, oh, I have nothing against him. I believe that too. I chose to be one of them. Went out. And now I am one of the so-called holy rollers because I see in there they got the sign of the living God living with them. And by faith, I believe it, that's the bunch will go in the rapture. And I would rather have it than all the PhDs and DDs that the church world could afford. Don't sympathize with them. Become one of them. That's when by faith you walk by faith, by the unseen. I see a church going in the rapture. I see Jesus coming for His bride. I see a little neglected bunch of people who are laughed at and made fun of go in the rapture one day. I'd rather be with them and all the groups that I know of in all the world. For by faith we see by the unseen. Sure, Moses chose to become, he saw by faith what they were. And that God had promised in 400 years he would deliver them. Yet he tarried for another 20 years, yet Moses believed him. And the reason I am on the field today in this move is because that by faith, one night yonder at Greensmill, Indiana, about 10 years ago, an angel of the Lord who had spoke to me from a child spoke to me about these things and I went out and connected myself. A lot of times I won't believe in the things that they're doing, but yet I believe there lays a church of the living God. And I would rather walk alone with the few people that really believe God and take Him at His word than to be with millions who denied Him. Amen. Certainly, their works would do it. Moses endured as seeing Him who is invisible. And at the end of his life's journey, oh, I'd just love to say this. Someone once said to me, he said, Mr. Branham, do you think God was just when he let Moses for 40 years with those people and then would refuse him to go into the promised land. But the glorious part of the story of Moses, he was in the promised land 800 years later with Jesus and Elijah and was seen on Mount Carmel. Not only that, but at the end of the road, when he was standing on the mountain waving goodbye to his people and he looked across Jordan. Amen. And he was 120 years old when his last breath began to fail him. He climbed up on that smitten rock from the wilderness and it was present. And he didn't, Amen. he had an angel pallbearers who took him somewhere and buried him that the world knew nothing about it. Because he had endured seeing the invisible. And in the hour of his death, the invisible was there. Amen. I wonder if he would become Pharaoh if it would have been that way. Very doubtful. But he was sure when he took the right choice. And you can be sure by taking the right choice. Joshua, 40 years later, after he had entered into the promised land, and to being the great military general, when this first battle, his enemies had walled into a place where there was no way for him to get to them. But by faith, he looked at the unseen because God gave Moses a promise while they were yet in Egypt. I have given you all Palestine. And by faith, Faith, he saw the walls of Jericho laying flat on the ground. And he marched around and around in full armor with not a doubt in his heart, but believing that God would do it. And when the trumpet sounded and the people shouted, the walls fell and they took the city. Why? He seen the invisible one. Remember before he did this, he was walking one afternoon. 
And he seen a man who was standing against the wall with his sword drawn. And Joshua, he drawed his sword and went to meet him. And he said, are you for us? Are you for the enemy? And the man spoke back and said, I am the captain of the host of the Lord. Joshua know the battle belonged to him. And when you people here tonight, that's sinful in your hearts. I don't mean that you live in adultery. I don't mean that you get drunk. I mean sin is unbelief. And with unbelief in your heart, if you just open up your heart and close your eyes and look at the chief captain who's ominous present tonight, the world will lay flat at your feet and it will shake every fetter of sin away from you. The doubting days will be over. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. I am told that a snake can catch the eye of a bird and charm that bird with its enchantments and the stare of its eyes until such a way if that bird will give the snake its attention for just a few minutes, that bird will flutter and completely become paralyzed. And the snake will take the bird. And I can believe that because I know of another serpent, the devil, that if he could ever catch the eye with his enchantments, with your modern rock and roll and all your fangdangles of the world, if he can ever catch you, young lady or young man, just long enough to get his charm in you, you'll flutter, but you can't get loose. He'll hold you till he swallows you up in sin. The only way that I am told that that little bird ever has a chance is to get his eyes off of the serpent and he cannot look at anything else because he stands staring. But if he'll take his eyes from the serpent and look upward and flutter his wings, he'll fly plumb out of the reach of the snake. And if you have ever got the charm of the world and the things of the world and unbelief charming around your heart that tells you all live modern, shake your head tonight And look up to the unseen one, the Lord Jesus, and flutter your wings of prayer until you fly plumb out of His reach and out of His clutches. If He should speak to you and say that divine healing is wrong, shake your head from Him quickly. If He should tell you that spiritual discernment is telepathy, shake your head from Him immediately. Amen. Look up to the unseen. Like Elijah told Gehazi, his servant at Dothan, while to look at around, there was a Syrian army. There was everything to smash them down because this man of God was able to tell the king of Israel what the king of Syria was thinking about in his bedchamber. Let me say this tonight, my audience. That God still lives and He's just the same tonight as He was then. He can still know your thoughts and what you're thinking about right now. Then you should watch the fruits of the Spirit to see if it's the God of history that's raised again. Certainly. And when the great crisis come, which always does, then when Gehazi, being just a lukewarm church member, when he had not seen what Elijah had seen, because Elijah was used to walking by faith, and he was looking at the unseen all the time, and he knew that God had said in the Psalms, the angels of God are encamped about those who fear Him. That was enough for Elijah. But Gehazi had just 
halfway believed it. He was just a church member. So Elisha said to the Lord, he said, Lord God, give a sign here. Just open this man's eyes and let him see what's around him. And when God opened his eyes, he saw horses of fire drawn by chariots of fire. And they were all around that old prophet. They were there all the time. But he just didn't see them. And tonight, I'd say the same thing. That the God who stood yonder in the first chapter of the books of Acts, and as he was taken up in the skies, become under his feet. That same Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you or forsake you. And the works that I do shall you always. I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. I am told by uh, aviators who fly these here real fast jet planes. And they say that the plane getting up to a certain speed, that it vibrates and it shakes and it seems like that the boat is going to fly out of it. That the wings are going to come off until they pass the sound barrier. But after they once pass that sound barrier, they say the plane just sails out. Just in ease. When it passes the sound barrier. That's the obstacle that's in the way of the plane. When it passes its own sound. And then it runs at ease. Oh, if the church of this day could ever pray till they pass the sin barrier and the unbelief barrier, they could shout the victory of a living God when they once pass that barrier by looking to the unseen and letting the world vibrate and do what it wants to do. But there is a living God. And when we lose our disbelief, and our unbelief in Him, and past that place that the world is saying, the days of miracles is past. It makes you shake. Oh, there's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It makes you wonder. But if you just look at the unseen to the God who promised it, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that is far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you look to the blessed word that says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday day, and forever, turn your heads towards that and press on until you pass that vibration of past the unbelief barriers and the sin barriers and all the barriers that seems to hinder you, then you'll fly free in the faith of God, knowing that all things are possible. Then there is no limit, they say, Harley, to the speed the plane will go. If there's no limit to the speed the plane will go, there's no limits to the blessings that God will pour down upon a believer that will believe. The Scripture claims Him to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, when he was here on earth, I do nothing except my father shows me first. When the woman at the well come to him, and she was a Samaritan. First there was a man came to him, and his name was Peter. And he said to this man, your name is Simon, and your father's name is Jonas. How did he know that? How did this lowly Nazarene carpenter know that man's name was Simon and his father's name was Jonas because he was endued with a power that could look at the unseen. He never looked at any letters written. He looked at the unseen, the God of heaven. Quickly they went and got another man around the mountain who had come many miles. And when he had told him along the road what Jesus had did, no doubt, but what Nathaniel was very skeptic of it. But when once in the sight of Jesus, Jesus said to him, 
Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. How did this man do it? There was nobody with him to say, this guy is an Israelite. How did he do it? He didn't read it off of any book. But he looked at the unseen to the God who knows the end from the beginning. And he said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, Nathaniel. He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. What was he doing? Looking at the unseen. When the woman at the well, a Samaritan, came out and he said, bring me a drink. And she said, the well's deep and you have nothing to draw with. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And she wanted to know who she was talking to. And she knew he was a Jew. And he said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask we women of Samaria such a thing as that. And so the conversation went on until Jesus caught her spirit. And he said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. And he said, that's right. You've got five husbands. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. And she said, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks with you. And she ran into the city and said, come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? And when Jesus and leaving the world after a ministry of that around the world, around the known world of that day, he said, the works that I do shall you do also. Listen to his going away. Lo, a little while, and the world, the visible, intellectual, cultured, scientific, the world will see me no more. That's exactly a prophecy. It can't help but be the truth. Jesus Christ said it. The intellectual believer, the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you even in you to the end of the age. And the works that I have done shall you do also. And more than this shall you do, for I go to my Father. This great God and Father that we're speaking of is not something it was. He's something that is. And if His people who are called by His name will get up past that barrier of what the world's got to say, what the church has got to say, what the science has got to say, and look to what God has to say. That minute you'll pass that vibration of unbelief and go free out of this building tonight just as happy as you can be. A serving God, feeling free, sins all gone, healed from your sickness, while it'll be wonderful. God would not be a God of justice who would reward one person of their faith and disreward another. He can't do it. If God took the leukemia out of that girl when she's laying on her and one of the best hospitals, John Hopkins, that could be gotten and her limbs falling from her. And one hour... After the prayer was made here, that child was pronounced sound and well by the same doctors. God can't be just. Let Congressman Upshaw, who had been in a wheelchair for 66 years, broken in his back, walked like Mr. Roosevelt, and would heal that man and bring him out of that chair by a vision. And if another man said in the same way and met the same faith, God would be unjust to heal one and let the other alone. That's right. Amen. He is just. It's us, friends. If we can move Amen. past that sound barrier. If we can get to a place where it don't make any difference who says it. As long as God said it's the truth, say long. I've always thought of that little poem in my school book when I was a little boy up here on the road. 
Many of you men and women of my age remember it. Sail on. Sail on and on. When Christopher Columbus was given ships by the Queen of Spain, and was because in his heart he saw a vision that the world was round and he had hardly a way he could prove it. He had nothing to do it with, but he was a man of vision. He believed it. And when the ship was given to him with a bunch of prisoners, cowards, that was his church members, a bunch of pullbacks, a bunch that was discouraged and tried to discourage him just a little while longer and will drop off the world. A serpent will rise to the bottom of the sea and wrap these little ships and pull it to the bottom. Now say, brave rover, say, what will you say? He said, sail on. Sail on and on. Sail on and on. God give us men in the church like that. I don't care what the scientific world says. I don't care what the denominational world says. I take God at His word and sail on. Sail on until you pass the barrier. Praise the Lord. We used to in the old church here used to sing this little song like this. I've crossed the separating line. I've left the world behind. If there ever was a time that the church needs to step across that line which separates you between faith and unbelief by sight and looking at the unseen by faith, it's now. That's when you leave everything behind you, ever care, ever weary, everything that says that you can't be a Christian. I've smoked too long. I've drank too long. Brother Branham, I've lived in adultery. I don't care what you say and what you've done. Though your sins be as scarlet, you once passed that line of barrier of the devil trying to torment you, saying you can't do it, you can't do it. Say, I can do it, for Jesus said, whosoever will let him come, drink from the waters of the fountain of life freely. Leave it behind. When you people that are sick and plowed through prayer line after prayer line, and you've been prayed for, you've been to the doctors, you've done everything, and still death stays at your door. When you get to a place to where you say, I don't care what the doctor says, I don't care what the scientific world says, Jesus Christ made a promise to me. And pass that barrier of vibrations to your soul that you're free and there's not one thing to shake you. You'll sail into your healing just as certain as I'm standing at this point. You'll never turn to look that way no more. You'll be looking this way. You're so free from them things. Say, days of miracles is past. There is no such a thing as divine healing. You can't get well. Your case is too bad. Sail on up above it. Climb the walls, yonder, until all is free. Every rope and every fetter has been cut loose. Every vibration is left in the back. And you're free and free indeed. Jesus Christ, God's Son, set in the church for you people for such things as this. First He set apostles. Then after that He sent prophets. Then teachers, pastors, and evangelists. To confirm this word. To prove that He is some great teacher. I don't mean He has to have a Ph.D., he might know less about the Bible than a, than a child that's still in his adolescence. Jesus knew more about the Scriptures at 12 years old than all the Pharisees did of the old learned sages. Amen. So you see, it doesn't take an intellectual mind. It takes a surrendered heart Amen. to the will of God. If Jesus Christ, God's Son, promised this Bible that He had saved to the uttermost, if He promised the things that I do, shall you do also? I'll be with you to the end of the world. And if that same Jesus could come tonight and take us into His control and we could set ourselves from not thinking of how's it going to be done, but looking at the unseen to the God who promised it. The same thing that I did to the woman at the well, I can do with you. 
The same sign that I showed to the world, to both Jew and Samaritan. I'll show it again in the days of the Gentiles. If he did it to them and proved himself to be Messiah like that and would do any other and let us go in on intellectual, it wouldn't be fair. He wouldn't be a just God. He's got to show the same sign. If he should come tonight and vibrate through this building and show himself that he is alive by performing the same signs, it ought to make every sinner's heart melt within him. It ought to make every sick person rise to their feet and give him glory. And pass every line of vibration and move on into those channels to where God can heal you and make you well. Think of those things while we pray. Merciful and eternal God, who was God before there was an Adam in the air, and will be God when there is not another Adam. You who formed the world and measured it in your hands and poured it out into space and said, let there be light. And there was light. Your words cannot fail. And it cannot fail tonight. For you have made a promise. These signs shall follow them that believe. That word is true. Lord God, we know that healing has been something that was purchased at Calvary, just as salvation was. And we're to look and live and believe and pass the barriers to prove to you that we're sincere. God Almighty, grant tonight that people may believe and be saved from their sins and their sickness. And I would ask that you would do this for the glory of God. And while we have our heads bound, I just wonder tonight how many inside and outside would like to make this confession to God. Lord, I I have been a church member for a long time, or maybe I haven't. But really, there's so much of the world vibrates to me. I have a temper. I have... Or something that just won't let me get to the place where I can believe like I ought to believe. Will you take that from me tonight, Lord, and let me pass the sin barrier of unbelief? Will you raise your hands to Him? God bless you. That's good. Oh, many hands all around. Lord, you see their hands. And made the Holy Ghost, which is now told them to raise their hands. May He come and set them free from the vibrations of the world. Till they can get beyond the, the paralyzed charm of the serpent. That the snake bite of sin, the enchantments of this modern world will not lure them any longer. May they raise their eyes to Christ just now. And receive Him as their Savior. And we'll praise Thee. In Jesus' name we pray. And now before we call for the sick and the afflicted. Is there some in here tonight who are sick, afflicted in any way? That would say, oh God. Let me pass the barrier line too. Give me faith to just move on up past all the thoughts of the devil and say, you ain't going to make it. You can't get it. Would you raise your hands and say, God, be merciful to me. God bless you. He sees all your hands are all over the building. Now, Father, grant that something will take place tonight that will cause these people to see that This is the truth, the Word of God. And that you will keep your promise to them just the same as you did to Abraham, or to Moses, or to any. How when you told Peter, walk to me on the water, and he never got down to see what kind of a bridge was under the water, 
He never even looked at that. He looked at Jesus. But when he got his eyes on the waves, he would sink. God, we pray tonight that those who step out tonight will pass that barrier of the waves. And will walk right on to Jesus by his bidding of coming. Hear us, Lord. And now give thy servant wisdom to know what to do at this hour, which will bring blessings, salvation of healing, both physical and spiritual, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now to you who raised your hands, I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to change the service just a little tonight. Last night we've taken them into the room. Tonight we're going to try to line them up and bring up a bunch to the platform. Then immediately after this service is over, when the pastor takes the service, I'm going to ask you who raise your hand, some 20 or 30 people, I want you to come and kneel at this altar. If you really meant it when you raise your hand, see, God will do it. If you really meant it, and will just speak and say, Lord, take every vibration of disbelief away from me, He'll do it. Amen. See, you can't run free. You can't do it in the scientific world with a plane. You can't do it in the spiritual world with the Spirit. As long as your human thoughts and intellectual thoughts I speak of is still holding you, while the, these church don't believe that, this church... Don't think that Jesus was the one who said it. And the church that tells you that it's wrong is a false prophecy. I don't say that to be mean, but I say that to be honest. Because I'll have to stand with you at the judgment. Those teachers who teach those things are wrong. Now let just show you what Jesus said. Then we'll see the great thing if it can be done. I guess these 200 people here to be prayed for. I want to ask you something. Upon this message now, of looking at the unseen, if the unseen one will declare himself visible, then it ought to make your soul pass every barrier. If the unseen one will make Himself visible here to you. Because He promised He would do it. Now remember, in, we are the Gentiles. Now when He was on earth, there was no one looking for Him but the Jews and the Samaritans. We, the Anglo-Saxon Gentiles, were yet heathens. We were worshiping idols, our fathers. But the Jews were looking for Him. And the Samaritans was looking for Him. And he come and proved that he was the one that they were looking for. And they disbelieved him. But there were some of the elected ones knew him and recognized him. Both Jew and Samaritan. Now it will be the same with the Gentile. Now the way he made himself known to the Jew and Gentile that he was. Now they said, what are you, what are you going to kill him for? He said, because that he is a man making himself God. He was both God and man. God was the inside man. Jesus was the outside man. The out, Jesus said, I do nothing in myself but what I see my Father doing. Anyone knows that. What the Father shows me, that's what I do. Now watch how he declared himself to the Jewish people. By telling Peter who he was. By telling Nathaniel who he was and what he'd done before he come. That's the way. And they said, you, Nathaniel said when he heard that, he said, You are the Christ, the King of Israel. But the unbelieving Jew said, the church world said, He's a spiritualist, he's a devil. He's a Beelzebub. Jesus said, you say that against me, it'll be forgiven you. Because they were Jews. But otherwise, in the last days when the Holy Ghost comes upon the Gentiles, one word against it will never be forgiven. In this world or the world to come. When the Holy Ghost has come to do the same thing, 
that he did, for the Holy Ghost would bear witness of him. So we put ourselves in a serious condition. Now, do you believe that that God is still the living God? Amen. Do you believe that we're living in the last days of the Gentile dispensation? And the churches are looking for Him to come? And do you believe He's getting them ready for His coming? The shadows of His coming is cast upon the earth. Trouble, distress, perplexed of time. And the shadow of His coming is placed over His church. And these things that we do in His name are just a shadow of what He'll do when He comes. When we see a child laying there dying with leukemia, straighten back to life in five minutes. That's a shadow of when He comes, the dust that's in the earth shall rise into the beauty of youth again. This is just a shadow, but it's to make you know that He's coming. Let's break loose and lay aside every fetter now. And if He will come tonight, and will do the same things that he'd done to the woman at Samaria and to the Jew. Will you Gentiles believe him and let your souls loose? Will you do it? Raise your hands to him. Say, I will. Praise God. Amen. Now we misunderstand. When we say healing, when we say salvation, there's no man can save you. I don't care what he does, he can't save you. He can't baptize you enough in water, he can't do nothing to save you. Christ saves you. But He's made the way for you to be saved. He can preach the Word. He can baptize with water. But Christ baptizes with the Holy Ghost. That's what John said. I baptize with water, but he that cometh after me baptizes with the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus can show His signs of Him being here. Preaching His Word by a minister. And come down and vindicate that Word by Him being here. But it's your faith that you're healed by. Now, let's be just as reverent as we can be. And please now, please, I don't say that he will do it, but we're going to call a little prayer line up here. And there's a group in here, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they told me they'd give out 100 cards. That means there's 100 people sitting here to be prayed for. We will get them, every one. If you just don't get discouraged and run away, we'll get every one of you. See? We can't get them all at one time, neither can we stand them all at one time. But we can stand some of them at a time. Maybe four, five, or six, whatever we can get on the platform around here. Or up and down the side where we can stand them. Because we haven't got the room. But if God will do for them as He did to prove Himself that He is here, then we ought to look to the unseen then. And believe. All you sick people that raise your hand, if Jesus will come and do the same things that he did when he was here on earth through human bodies. I was astonished the other day when I seen one of the greatest teachers I thought in the world. He is a great man. Don't misunderstand me. Billy Graham, who the Lord is using, a great man. But it was a piece in the paper. That some of the, someone somewhere had wrote into him and wanted to know, what about the Trinity? Was there actual three gods or was there just one God? And Billy Graham answered him and said, it's not been revealed yet. We have this paper. Oh, brother, don't you never believe there's three gods? There's only one God. There's three offices of that one God. The fatherhood, the sonship, and the Holy Ghost. God condescending from heaven. He stayed on the mountain in a pillar of fire. He came down and was made flesh and dwelt among us in the sonship from the fatherhood. And now dwells in His church as the Holy Ghost. Same God. Not three gods, the same God. See? The same God. Now look. When he was here on earth, listen closely now. When he was here on earth, he said this. A little while the world won't see me, yet you shall. I come from God 
and I return to God. How many knows the scripture says that? Well, what he was when he was here on earth, then he must have returned back to do the same. And a little while, and I'll be with you, even in you, and the works that I do shall you do also. See? That makes him the same, that same branch. Just keep going on out the vine. See? See? Uh, one branch here, another church age here, another one here. It's branches off of the vine. I noticed him in the branch there. When he was here on earth, he said he come from God, which was the pillar of fire. And he said he returned back to God. After his death, burial, and resurrection, Paul was on his road down to Damascus and something struck him down. You remember that? Acts the 8th chapter, I believe. And when he looked up, that pillar of fire that was in the wilderness, Jesus Christ had turned back to a pillar of light that put his eyes out. Is that right? Then he had returned to God. And Paul said, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. He was a pillar of fire. I say this to the tabernacle, not sacrilegious. But do you know that same one, that same spirit is with us now. We got his picture hanging here. But scientific world. And the signs that he did back there shows that he's still living in his church. Not another kind of a sign, but the same sign. A little while and the world sees me no more than intellectual. But ye who've passed the sound barrier to believe the word, you'll see me. I hope that you are in the ease tonight. Let us pray. Lord, now the rest of the service, it will have to be you after such words as this. To confirm that you have told the truth, I pray that you will grant these blessings through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, how many you with the prayer cards in here? We can't raise you all up at once, but you'll just not be discouraged. Tonight, tomorrow night, Sunday and Sunday night, so forth, we'll get you. But now let's begin tonight and start bringing just a few up. And those who's got cards that can't walk, I'll call you one by one and place you here. And if you can't walk when I call your number, then you raise up your hand. And then some of the ushers here will come and pack you. All right. Prayer card number one, who has it? Raise up your hand. If you have prayer card number one, raise up your hand. Surely... Somebody maybe can't... Or maybe I did, was wrong. Where's Billy? Maybe it was... What? Yes, all right. Can, if you can walk, sir, come right over here. Prayer card number two. If you can raise your hands, raise your hand. All right. Number three. Right here. Would you come right here? If you can. Now, if you can't, just keep waving your hand and some of them will come pack you. Number three. Number four. What is that letter? J. J. All right. Number four. Would you raise your hand? The lady in the back already to her feet. Number five. Now when Billy comes down to give out the prayer cards or Leo or Jean, Brother Woods or whoever gives them out, they come up here before you and mix those cards up together and just give you whatever prayer cards you want. See that's up to you just to get your card. You might, one sitting by, you might have number one. The next might have number 15. The back over here, I have number two. They're just mixed up. All right. Prayer card number three. Who has it? Over here. All right. Number four. Number five. Number five. Number six. Way back in the bank. All right. If you will, back there, just let that young lady through. Number seven. Would you raise your hand? Yours are number seven, sister. All right. Number eight. Would you raise your hand? If you can, the lady right here. Number eight. All right, sister, take your place. Number nine. This lady here. All right, sister. Number ten. All right. 
Number 10. Let's, let's rest it there because we're getting congested there a little bit. If they'll just move back just a little bit, please. But we'll get 10. I guess you have 10, do you, sister? If you'd move right along those gentlemen right there, they'll let you in the line. Now, all right. How many? Number nine is missing. Oh, there uh, can't. Oh, if she can't walk, just let her sit there and bring her when her number's called. Be all right. Just one your number. If you can't stand very long, sister, just wait till your number's called, and you can come. That's all right. All right. Just just be seated. That's all. Right. Now, if she can't walk, well, when her number's called, some of them a packer here or whatever more. That's all right. All right. Number. What was the other numbers was missing? That's all. All right. Now we got. How much is that? The end of the line right there. Well, all right. Now, I want to know that you all in this line, that's standing in the line here now, I want to ask you this question. Do you solemnly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And you believe that He has risen from the dead? And He is not dead now, but He's a living. Do you believe that that He can perform and do the same that He did when He was here on earth? And you believe that He has sent His Spirit into His church to continue His work on? How many of you are strangers to me? Raise up your hand. I don't know you. All right? I don't know you. All right? Was that every hand? All the hands was up that they didn't know me? All right? I am a stranger to those people. I have never seen them. How many in the building are strangers to me that I don't know you? No matter, you don't have to be up here, just anywhere. Well, let's see, over half the congregation is strangers. All right? If I be then a stranger to you, I want to ask you out there in the, the audience, if Jesus was living today, and see if this is a scripture... One time there was a woman who had a, a great thing wrong with her, an issue of blood. She'd had it for about 12 years, I think, or longer. And she spent all of her money to the doctors. Here's two girls sitting here in wheelchairs. You believe, girls, that Jesus has raised in the dead? You looking to Him tonight for help? Have you got, have you got, any, uh, have you got a prayer card? All right. It just hasn't been called yet. It's all right. Just be faithful. All right, don't doubt, just believe him. And if your card's not called tonight, just come back get it tomorrow night. See, just keep, no matter, just keep coming, see. You'll get here. And you don't have to even have your card, just believe. Watch what takes place. And to you out there in the audience who doesn't have a prayer card, how many people in here doesn't have a prayer card? Raise your hands. Look at there. Now you without a prayer card, if... These people here, I'm going to base them on a scripture. Everything we must do must be scriptural from Genesis to Revelation. It must be God. As I spoke last night, it must be so from the beginning. Now, if you don't have a prayer, these here has got a prayer card. I'm going to a- ask them scriptures like it meant in the Bible, both men and women. And to you out there that doesn't have a, a, a prayer card, I, that you won't be in the line tonight. Now, you can have prayer cards again tomorrow. But now, and you'll finish out as many, and we'll get them through here some way and pray for them. If you just be patiently. Don't be in a hurry. See, then you get to vibrating yourselves. See? Just stand still. Say, God, I'm here. You know me. And, and then you say this. There is a scripture in the Bible where this woman had an issue of blood, and she passed through a bunch of people who was trying to get her to keep still. And she wanted to get to the Master, the Lord Jesus, and she finally got to where he was, for she said in her heart, If I can touch that man's garment, I'll be made well. How many ever heard that story? Now, Jesus going along with the crowd. And after a while, the woman touched him. And her heart, she thought, what did she do then? That was her anticipations. When she touched that, she passed the sound barrier. That was it. She was free. Or in her heart, she said, I've done exactly what I thought if I do. I'd get healed. And 
Do you believe if Jesus will make yourself known tonight, you'll get the same thing? All right. Now just believe, keep that in your heart. And then she walked out over in the audience somewhere, perhaps, and sat down. Jesus stopped and said, Who has touched me? And they said, Nobody touched you. Everybody said, We never, we never. Everybody denied it. Nobody touched you. And Peter said, Lord, he rebuked him and said, What would you say a thing like that for? Something on this matter? Who touched you when everybody's touching you? Running against you. Hello, Rabbi. Glad to meet you, Rabbi. Hello, Jesus. Uh, Galilean prophet. We, we are so glad to meet you. How do you do? Everybody's touching. He said, that might be true. But I, somebody touched me different. Amen. That's the touch you want. Somebody touched me in a way that they passed the sound barrier. I felt virtue, weakness come up on me. Strength went out of me. And he looked around. And in him dwelt the Spirit of God. You believe that? And he looked around over the audience until he found the person that had touched him. And he told her her conditions and said that her faith had saved her. No vision. No. He just knew that her faith had saved her. Because the pull of all the faith in there, it was so much greater in her. Now, if Jesus is the same today, won't he do the same? Now, how will you know it's him? See, now you have to submit yourself. Now, here's where I have to look to the unseen. <laughs> Are you the first one? Where's, who's in the whole line? You, Brother Neville? Oh, all right. you're the first man. All right. Now, you can just walk a few steps closer, if you will, sir. Here is the man that I have. I believe you said we didn't know each other. So this is our first time meeting. How do I know that man? I don't. God knows as far as I as far as I know, I've never seen him in my life. There's a perfect stranger. Now I have said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now that's basing a lot of faith. If that's not so, then I'm found a hypocrite and the Bible a lie. Now what do I have to do now? Look to some intellectual thing? How can I? I've got to look to the unseen. Amen. Well, why am I doing it? He promised it. There you are. Now you do the same. And you do the same, all of you. Do the same. It can't fail. I can fail, you can fail. But God can't fail. I here's two men met the first time in their life. Now, so it, I'm, take my time. Now, this is a scriptural scene. There was a man who went and got a man and brought him to the church or where Jesus was at and his name was Nathaniel. Jesus had never saw him. So when he come up to Jesus, Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no God. If I'd say that so that you would know what I was saying, I'd say, There's an honest man, a Christian believer. They'd say, Well, he said, Rabbi, well, you never seen me in your life. How do you know me? How did you know? Now, not the way he was dressed because all the Easterners dressed the same. He could have been a Greek. He could have been an Egyptian. He, he could have been many things. But Jesus said he's an Israelite. And he's honest and there's no guile in him. He said, how did you know it? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. That was Jesus yesterday. If he's the same today and dwelling in us, when he promised he would and will make known to this man, he might be here for financial troubles. He might be a man dying. He might be a man of sin. He might be a man of righteousness. I don't know. I can't tell you. But God does know it. Then if he will make himself known here that Jesus lives and will tell the man, then let him be the judge whether it's right or not. And then, will that make all of you believe him? That he is visible here. That's his being now, he can't show himself in a corporal body. It's his spirit. Now, he permitted his picture to be taken there. You see that, which the scientific world has in Washington, D.C. Same angel of God, same pillar of fire, dwelt in Jesus, done the same thing to, the, to Philip or Nathaniel. The same Jesus promised to come and dwell in us and do the same works. Everybody understand well now? All right. Now, Lord, let it be known that thou art God. And that we are your servants. 
then you love us and you're wanting these people to believe you and to pass up all the barriers of sin in the world that they might be saved and healed for your glory. Amen. Now, just to say like Peter did at the gate called beautiful to the man that was lame from his mother's womb. He said, look on us. That was just a... Uh, to believe, to get him to his attention, to catch his attention. Like our Lord did the woman at the well. He called her and called a conversation. He said, bring me a drink of water. So he went on talking. Now, if I don't know you, you're just a man that's out there in the audience. And if I don't know you, and the Lord will explain to me something that you have done in your life, or what you're desiring for, finances, health, or whatever it is, and will make it truly and clearly, then you'll believe that He's sure to give you what you're asking for. Amen. You'll do that? Amen. All right. Reverence now. I just be in prayer till the Holy Spirit begins to settle on us. Yes, I see this man and he, I see a little person that's standing near he's in question of or he's wanting to be prayed for it's somebody else you want to be prayed for that's a, a girl a little girl and you're not from this country you're from a near a, a big lake somewhere it's, uh, you're from a city that's near a great city that's got a big dome. It's uh, Buffalo, New York. You're near Buffalo, New York. You have high blood pressure. That's what's wrong with you. But you're praying for this child. You believe me to be his servant? You're Mr. Holden. That's your name. Return back and receive what you've asked for. Put that handkerchief on it. It'll be over. Do you believe Jesus Christ lives? What is it? The unseen becomes visible. What is that? The same Jesus, the same fruits, the same signs, the same thing that he did. Now here's the woman next. I speak to her like he did the woman at the well. Are we strangers to each other? We are. So the people know on the outside, just, just raise your hand up. So, well, This is our first meeting. We're strange to each other. Now, I don't know what the man had a few minutes ago, but whatever it was, I didn't have nothing to do with his healing. God did that. His faith did that. I had nothing to do with it. It's just a gift. For in this building now, it's just the same kind of angels that Gehazi seen when Elijah opened his eyes. Amen. In this building is the Lord Jesus. So don't look at what you see. Look at what you don't see. Because it's a promise of God that God said He'd do this. And He's doing it. Now He talked to the woman just a minute. Until He found what her trouble was. And that's the way I would like to do to you because He remains the same. If I'm a stranger and don't know you, then He'll he'll have to be some way, some supernatural some way, to contact you. Would you believe that was your Lord? Was permitting me to do that? Now if you want to know. There was something happened in the building just then. A healing. It's a lady sitting here, right out here in the audience, kind of a heavy set lady. She's got her hands up and her eyes closed to praying. She's got a bowel trouble and a back trouble, and she's praying for God to heal her. She's sitting right here, wearing glasses, a dark suit on, right at the end of this row. You just got your hands up, that's what was wrong with you. If that's right, raise your hands like that. I don't know you, do I? No, sir. We're strangers. 
Go home now. You touched the border of his garment. You touched him because I'm 20 feet from you. But you touched him, the high priest, that could be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Now the rest of you. There's a lady without card, without anything, just sitting there waiting. You do the same. So, you are the wife of the man that was just here. Because I see you're both in the same house. And you're suffering with a nervous condition. Also, I see you've been to a doctor. And you've had an examination. And the examination was at the bottom parts. And he says, by look, it says it's gross. And that's in the stomach and in the female organs and wants you to be operated on. But you've had faith and believe that if you'd come here and I'd pray for you, you'd be healed. Amen. That's right. Raise up your hands the people see. Now he who knows her here and knows the conditions, can he do it? Amen. Come here. Lord Jesus, grant, oh God, that her faith and joy will be filled tonight. That she will be set completely free and bring joy and salvation to those who she contacts. I send her and cast away this evil from her in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You feel different now. Just keep feeling like that and rejoicing. It'll leave you for good forever. How do you do? Just be real reverent just a moment. As far as I know, our first time meeting. But God knows us both. He knows about you and He knows about me. And if He will reveal to me what you're here for, or something that you've done that you should not have done, or something you ought to have done that you did not do, but you know that I have no idea what you're here for. If that's right, raise up your hand. But it would be have to come through some supernatural discernment. I'm so glad that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're not asking prayer for yourself, though you need it. <coughs> You're asking for your son. And your son is not here. He is in a large city. A big city. And it's in the east. I've been there. My last campaign was there. Philadelphia. That's right. He's a preacher. And they're going to operate on him. And they're examining for a, a rupture. That's thus saith the Lord. You believe that God will do what you're asking Him to? Oh, eternal God, confirm the woman's faith with sign and wonder. Grant the deliverance of this to what she asked for. To Jesus Christ's name I ask it. Amen. May God give to you that what you ask for. Be reverent. A little lady with her handkerchief up to her nose praying for a trouble with her head. You believe the Lord Jesus make you well? The lady sitting right here with the man with glasses on. You believe that God will heal you, little lady with the blue looking dress on? Raise your hand if that's what was wrong. Go and be healed. Your faith makes you well. You believe Jesus Christ, God's Son, could reveal to me what you're here for? You have many things wrong with you. Very nervous. Complications. Female trouble. Ladies trouble. Almost a breakdown. Terrible conditions. You're not from this city, yet you're from Indiana. Lafayette. 
Miss Ellison, return. Your sickness has left you. Go home and show what God has done for you. Amen. Do you believe that God can tell me what you're here for? If He will, will you believe Him with all your heart? You're not here for yourself. You're here for that baby. If God will tell me what's wrong with that baby, will you believe me? It's a blood tumor. That's right, isn't it? You believe if I'll ask God to cast that out of the baby, the baby will live? Bow your heads. Now the baby's too little to have faith, you see. Oh Lord, God, they brought to you infants and you bless them. That same Jesus stands present now. I condemn this devil that's trying to take the life of this infant child. Leave it, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of the baby. Now, take it. Don't disbelieve. The thing will leave the baby. Have faith. Dad, sitting there with your head bowed with that gallbladder trouble. I don't know you, but he knows you. You suffer with gallbladder attacks. And you have a great pressure in your chest. If that's right, wave your hand. You believe me to be his prophet? Then go home from this meeting and never suffer with it again. Be well. In the name of the Lord Jesus. You believe me to be his servant? If God will tell me you're troubled, will you believe with all your heart? Now there's something happening in the building. Just keep on believing. But there's something coming in strong, so strong. There's a colored woman standing by the side of this lady. Just keeps fading. I see a colored woman. She's sitting right back here. She's got arthritis and complications. She's sitting right next to Mrs. Bell there. She's got a black hat on. I don't know her. But sister, if you believe God the way He was promising, then you would believe Him. It'll be over. Now that you might know that this be the Spirit of God, the next row behind the woman, a man sitting there with trouble with his neck. If you believe, sir, God will make you well. If you'll believe it. Do you believe it? Raise up your hand. I'm a stranger to you, but he's not. See, wherever you are, just have faith in God. Can you pass that barrier of unbelief now? Can you let the Holy Ghost come right in now and take over? If you can, it can happen. That diabetes will leave you if you believe it. Go on your road and rejoice. Amen. What do you think about it? Amen. He's the lily of the valley, the morning star. Amen. If you believe for that anemic condition, it'll leave you. Do you believe it? Go on your road and rejoice, Sam. Do you believe? Amen. Let's believe with all of our heart. If you believe, go eat your supper. That ulcer that was in your stomach has left you. Go eat. Believe. If you believe, you won't have to die. That cancer left you. You believe it? Go and rejoice. How many believes with all your heart? Stand up on your feet just now. Raise to your feet right quick. Raise up your hands right into God. Now, with one accord, pass every barrier. Believe that God is here. And the sickness and diseases shall leave. Every person pray in your own way. Oh Lord God, creator of heavens and earth. I now bring this to you, this audience of people. I condemn the devil. I claim that Jesus Christ, God's son, is present. In the name of the Lord Jesus, let every unclean spirit of doubt, superstition, unbelief, and sin depart out of this building. Come out, Satan. 
I adjure thee by Jesus, the Son of God. Each one of you lay your hands over on one another now and pray for each other everywhere in the building and God shall make you well. Believe it with all your heart. Lay your hands over on one another. Start praying for each other. That's it. That's the way. All that believe that you're healed, raise up your hands and praise God. All right, Brother Neville.